Father, we thank you and praise you for the blessings you give us, for waking us up this morning, for our health, for our safe travel here. All these are gifts from you, Father. Very often we take things for granted that are actually brought to us by your hand. We pray that uh, our discussions this morning as we meditate and talk about the writings of someone that lived 50, 60 years ago, we pray that all of our activity will be glorifying to you. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence with us by your spirit. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> Yeah. Let's go to page 252. The antithetical to the war. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to begin the second paragraph. It hardly needs to be argued that stronger, the stronger the contrast of the church and the world, the greater is the glory of the church. White never seems quite so white as when it is seen against the black background. So the holiness and the beauty of the church of Christ stand out most strikingly when contrasted with the filthiness and the depravity of the world. I think since the artist is sitting right next to me, you will wholeheartedly agree that when we have white and black, the contrast really stand out. And then I will pause here because this paragraph gave me some understanding, a little piece of it, about the question I raised to uh, Henley a few weeks ago. If you were there at the time, I asked Henley, I'm gonna be a devil's advocate, and I want you to explain that to me, if you remember. At the garden, Satan uh, deceived Adam and Eve. From that point, entire humanity fell, without any exception. The only exception is Jesus Christ. But he's the only one came from above and not born from the earth. So he's the only one in human form not fallen. But other than that, entire humanity, including all of us, are fallen. No exceptions. Yet, when Christ came at the crucifixion, the results are, according to the scriptures, God does not save and God does not elect the entire humanity. And that was part of John's struggle also. If God is so loving, caring, why he does not elect, save entire humanity out of his love is our pea brain's arguments. And so that's understandable. So why is it? And that's what my question was to Henry, that then does that mean Satan's power is stronger than God? Absolutely not, according to the scripture. It is under his dominion. He has to have his God's permission to do certain things. Yet God did the design not to elect entire humanity from what we understand from the book, only some portion of humanities are elected from the foundation of the world and big number goes to hell. Why is it? And this passage gives me a some understanding that <coughs> the stronger the contrast of the church and the world, the greater the glory of the church. I said, okay, if I take that parallel passage to like this, God's holiness and glory versus against fall and sin. You put the two contrast, then it becomes a very strong contrast. If you look at the God's glory 
and his holiness, which are absolutely perfect against the, the fall and sin of our humanity. And the contrast becomes so obvious. And then the glory of holiness becomes more visible. Then we may say, that's not fair. Because if I'm not elected, wait a minute. How come it is so good and so glorious? The people who are not elected may argue that. But that's how the glory shows. That's God's glory. So I gave an example also a long time ago when I go to skiing in the winter. Sometimes we have whiteout situations when we have a snow blizzard. Everything is white. You cannot see 10 feet ahead of you. You cannot see the trees. You cannot see the cliff. You cannot see the rocks. Everything is white. And you're in the midst of white. And you have no clue where you are heading. You're going. Only thing you know is you're going downhill by feeling of your feet. Gravity takes you down. And that's what I felt one time when it was whited out. I was hoping to stop. After I make one turn, I better stop. And then I misjudged the, the slope, and I just tumbled. And then I realized, wow, we need the visual image of rocks, trees, the cliffs, so I know I shouldn't go there. That's the boundary I live in. So I enjoy the freedom within the boundary of God's law. That's the true freedom I enjoy. If I go over the fence, I hurt myself and not a good result. So I said, okay. And then this contrast came to mind connecting these two examples. So I'm gonna stop because this is a heavy, deep topic. I wanna see how you all respond to that paragraph. I live in a system like living, and we have yeah. um, a lot of different caregivers. And the difference between those who know the Lord and who are serving versus I'm thinking of one in particular who could care no less and who will sign her initials that she's done a certain job and she has not. And I have at least three witnesses. The contrast is so striking. Yeah. yeah you can yeah. start to say something. I think <clears throat> to me the greater question is why should he choose any of us? When you compare the, the purity of him and the, and the beauty and when you compare who we really are, why should he pick us? None of us deserve that. Yeah. None. Maybe you. No. <laughs> None. None of us. Yeah. yeah. So. But the difference that he makes in those to whom he gives the Holy Spirit again shows his glory that he can do it. Not because of us, but the fact that he can do it. I always felt like the bottom line and the really um, if you stop if just with our conversation <coughs> this morning right now I would not be encouraged because if I were s struggling from a self-effacement position and I was saying I might not be one of the elect you know or someone that I love might not be um, to me, it comes down to he is trustworthy and I can rest in his person. He is so glorious that I can rest in that. So if I try to wrap my mind around why he chose, why he elected some and didn't others, then I'm placing myself in a, a position of just trying to discern something I can't. Um, and when I've been there, I grieve a lot for those that I know that are gone and that are probably in hell. Um, but a consoling thing to me is that he made it all about 
himself first in relationship, and he didn't come first with the Ten Commandments. He came with himself and walked and talked with Adam in the garden. It was personal, and it was precious, and it was relational, but he was presenting himself as glorious, fatherly, wonderful, and I can rest there. Um, and when I had that struggle, I got I had to get to that point where I just said, this is who I know you to be. So even if you did condemn me to hell, it would be because you are the all-wise, all-knowing uh, Father. So. And I'm going to take you one step further, deeper, then the non-elect condemned the souls will say, that's not fair. It's not loving. It's not caring. <clears throat> you can argue. But if you look at the whole creation, the focus is whole Bible we have and whole creation is all about him. It's not about me, actually. It's not about me. I'm not the focus. God That's is what the I was focus. saying. It just took me two pages for you to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm at the other end, and I'm open for whatever. And, and luckily, this isn't an issue that separates salvation from, from being saved and unsaved. This isn't that issue. And there's Armenians and Calvinists, and, and, but I, I can't reconcile the fact that we're innocently born. I didn't ask to be born. I didn't ask for my parents. I didn't, even, I didn't ask to be come into sin. I didn't ask for Adam to have messed up. I'm born in sin. I don't have a choice. I'm going to sin today and the rest of my life. I'll do, hopefully do a little better. And I could, I could handle God electing and the others just disappear. I can't handle God putting him in hell and suffer for eternity with no choice, no option, didn't choose it, never had, you know, that can't mesh with me right now. So what meshes with me is God, know, he knew, he knows what's going to happen a thousand years from now. He knows everything that everyone's going to do. He knows my thoughts before I think them. He knows what every person's choice is going to be with the revelation that they receive about God. He knows what we're, how we're going to respond. Whether we're going to reject it, pursue it, accept it, wonder about whatever. So I think his elect are those that he knows want to, you know, want that understanding and that choice. That's just my way of reconciling this that makes sense to me. Yeah, but And he says in his word, I wish that none would perish. Now why would he say I wish that none would perish when he knows he's going to let them perish? He, he also says, uh, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills. Mm -hmm. and well, sure. And that, 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 pardons that. whomever he wills. So, you know, it's like the potter, the clay saying to the potter, does the potter, does the, does the, does the potter have the right over the clay? Well, if you're going to send the pot to hell to suffer, then I think maybe there's a little bit of there's a little bit of something to talk about. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I know I'm not a Calvinist, and I know I fall out of the the realm here. But what do you, if what do you think are the attributes of God? He's absolutely holy. He's absolutely all powerful. He's not. We're going to have himself sitting up in heaven wringing his hands like, boy, I wonder what John's going to do. I sure hope he chooses me. No, he knows. He knows. He ordains. The he, he knew is, before he the foundation knows of the world. He knows what's going to happen. He ordains what's going to happen. But he then tells us, my ways are not your ways. We can't figure out why with our little, as you like to say, pea brains. We right. can't figure out why he does things the way he does. We just have to know 
and accept that he is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-holy, and what he does is righteous and right. We have to accept that. Yeah, and I can, and I, I, I sit on that. But then, if, if my pea brain wants to figure out maybe how he does it, then I, I, I that's the way I go. Then you're getting in too deep. Huh? You're not going to be able to. Oh no, I understand that. that. Not, in, not in this life. <laughs> I understand that. Not in this life. But, you know, I'm just glad there's a lot of people on both sides, a lot of smart people on both sides, a lot of dedicated people on both sides. That's the contrast. Yeah. That's the black and white. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it glorious? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you were starting to say something. Back in the 70s, I came across a reprint of a book. I don't know how old it was, but quite old. It was called The Shorter Catechism Illustrated. And... Uh, the illustrator, probably half of the illustrations I didn't, I didn't get why those illustrations were put, but not illustrated in, in the sense of visual illustration, but of examples. But the, the one I remember was, <laughs> and I don't remember how the question goes, but talking about God chose some uh, to be the elect and talked about a man who was struggling with this why why should God choose some and not others? And he, he agonized over it and agonized over it and finally came to the position, he said, God is absolutely just in condemning people to hell and choosing some. He is absolutely just. I believe that even if I am not of the elect. And that submission to God's being God was the beginning of the Holy Spirit's working in his heart to convince him that he was of the elect. Now, that was how God used it. It was not because he did that that he became elect. He was already elect but had no no sense of it until he got to the place where he said God is God. And uh, I'm, I'm submitting to whatever he, he wills for this world. You know, coming from the other side of the fence myself for 40 years of a Buddhistic walk until I reached to the point of a spiritual bankruptcy, I was not willing to surrender. It took that bankruptcy. I tried to figure it out. I tried to cultivate. I tried to walk it out. I tried to build up good stuff against the bad stuff. Nothing worked. I realized I cannot reach the purity with my own effort. Even after 40 years of hard labor, dedication, practice, cultivation, meditation, prayer, all that, realize cannot get to that purity by my labor. Can't. And none of that, none of that was of any value. And that's where I, again and again, I think, well, maybe, I don't think it, but I act as if I think uh, God will like me better if I do this or don't do that. And none of my efforts have had any relevance to, to what God has done in my life. If I borrow Joe's expression, that is an effort to polish, dry, the clump yeah. of dung. <laughs> see what it shines I mean that's the Joe's expression that connects to the next page let's go to 255 the long first paragraph we we'll go to there <clears throat> uh, under the topic of absolute antithesis nor is this to say the man of the world is less than human 
in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, Shylock contends that the Jews are people too. He argues, has not a Jew eyes, has not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, heard with the same weapons, subject to the same disease, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not believe? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? Certainly in that sense, unbelievers too are people. In fact, they are more human in a more exalted sense. In them are remnants of the image of God in which man was originally created. They still possess rationality, morality. However, even the morality of a natural, unregenerate man is to quote the canons of God only, some knowledge of difference between good and evil, and some regard for virtue and good outward <coughs> behavior, which he is incapable of using a right even in things natural and civil, and in various ways renders holy, polluted, and hinders in unrighteousness. In, Christ, in the Christian, on the other hand, the image of God has in principle been restored to his pristine glory of true knowledge of God, true righteousness, true holiness, and that means the difference between the image of God in a Christian and that image in the non-Christian is not merely quantitative, so that the former has more of it than the latter, but the difference is qualitative. And if you go to the next page, uh, toward the bottom of it, about 10 cent sentences up, <clears throat> in principle, the Christian does this eating, drinking, as well as all other things to the glory of God. Whereas the man of the world does precisely nothing to God's glory. And if you look at the, in the today's world of the philanthropy, there are some extremely wealthy people who donate millions and billions of dollars for certain charities. For good cause, good purpose, it's a good stuff. They give money away back to the humanity. And then if you ask their motive, I don't believe they're doing that to God's glory. Most of them they're doing it, they think it is good for humanity. It is good for the country, it's good for the poor people, it's good for the sick people, and all that. But if you look down deep, prime motive inside of the heart, often we find it is for your pride, it is for your reputation, it is for your self-righteousness, not God's glory. Those non-Christian generous people are not giving money away to glorify God. In a sense, deep down in the heart, they want to be exalted. Contrast, Christian organizations, whatever they do, is back to God's glory. With turning this glory back to Him. So, some time ago, I mentioned that the visual images, when we were complimented of a good work, I said, carry mirror 45 <coughs> degrees covering your face, so all the compliments, glory, comes to you, goes right back to up, send back to the God. And problem is, those mirrors has a manufacturer defects, occasionally <laughs> has a little tiny hole, and the light comes to your heart and your heart swells. And that's a problem of our humanities. But this is a good passage contrasting Christian 
non-Christian, believer, non-believers motive, the behavior inside, outside, I thought that was worthy of reading it. Any comments on these? Well, getting back to John's <laughs> difficulty, um, we know that God knows everything, that he ordains everything. The question is, does God ordain that you have that little hole there that lets the light come in to you? Well, is that something that he put there? Or is it something that Satan put there? Or is it something that we put there? We know, God, God knows in advance it's going to be there. Isn't it also... I mean, obviously, I, my brain can't comprehend it all, but, you know, the, the free will of hum, humans and the fact that we, God created us with inquiring minds and, uh, you know, you've heard in here before, my journey, I, I can't climb into other people and figure out how what their life was like. All I know is, from my perspective... I had a, I knew there were supernatural powers, you know, having gone through engineering and see, seeing engineering formulas and what science does and then seeing supernatural things, there was something, that's what drove me to Christian science and Mary Baker Eddy and Mormonism and the Pearl of Great Price and, and Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, L. Ron Hubbard's and Transcendental Meditation and Meditation and Hypnosis and everything else to try and figure out what the truth was. I mean, that was the key. What the heck is the truth? Which ultimately led me to study the Bible, which I thought had no relevance to me, except I wanted to know historically how it fit in. And all of a sudden, wow, every, every question I had was answered and the truth was revealed. And that's how, you know, that's my journey. It was, God gave me an inquiry, you know, I wanted to know what the heck the truth was. Uh, and I didn't like the Christian truth, quite frankly. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't what aligned up with what I was, my lifestyle or what I thought would give me the most pleasure. I learned later that it is, but, uh, so, but it was a process. So I just think God gives us that inquiring mind. I don't think he put it, we're robots that have no choice, no understanding, no options, no nothing. We're just programmed, wound up, and that's it. I just don't think that's the way God created us. I think he gave us the desire to understand truth, interest in what's going on around us and options to understand who he is and what he requires of us. Have you thought about the image of God we bear in our heart? It has The image of God has will to exercise. <laughs> John, it seems to me like you're answering your own question in that you searched all these other sources in darkness and it, it wasn't you that found the truth God illuminated you he was he was primary and illuminated you with the truth of the word and it penetrated and then you made your choice that wasn't I mean, I, I look back at the scripture, it says we love God because he first loved us. Uh, it's not like there was some element in us that searched for the truth and found it. We're illuminated first, and then and then we find it, then we find the truth. So it seems like you're answering your own question to me. Um, well, I don't know, maybe I am, but... Obviously, there's millions and millions of people sucked into deception in all sorts of yeah. cults and the, that's human. Uh, and, so, and and to me, that's demonic. That it's the power that we're up against. Right. And those powers, I had a he, I had an incredible healing by a Christian Science practitioner. 
of a major motorcycle accident, they wanted to hospitalize me, and she healed my neck. And so reading Science and Health and Key to the Scriptures every day in the little reading room made a lot of sense to me because I saw some power there. How do you know she did it? <laughs> well, it was, it was, it was during I that... What, I didn't know that God didn't... That well, he, he might have. Uh, although I think Ouija boards and, and astrology and all those things can suck people in by having success with it and suck them into a system that... that See, we're ultimately destroys us. We're always looking for success, and we fall prey to whatever we think gives us success. I think it's a trap that Satan lays for us. Well, and and uh, that's why I say the power of that woman to heal me was was not. It was demonic, but you know the. I think there's. It may, it may have been that the neck wasn't as bad as you thought it was. <laughs> and then it just took a little time to get it better. I mean, it could have been all kinds of stuff, but the point is that there are demonic forces yeah, are. that work in those systems to suck people deeper and deeper into them. Uh, I mean, I practiced medicine for many years, and there were a lot of people that said, you saved my life. <coughs> They're still here, but I don't think I saved their life. I was just doing what I could. I think God intervened and and was active in in their illness or, or, or blessed whatever treatment we prescribed. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we give credit to things of people that really the credit should go to God. Oh, and I and I agree. I. Uh and I don't know. I mean, I'm no genius by any stretch of the imagination, but I just sense in my spirit that a loving God provides options for all his creation. He gives them an option. And he knows what they're going to do with that option. And, it, you know, because what you said a minute ago, I say, he wishes none to perish and all would be saved. And then the other verse is, you know, the potter and the clay. I think my, my theory encompasses both of them and it makes sense. Your theory only, only covers one and leaves mine totally out. I wish that none would perish. Now, how do you justify that? I can justify that by the fact that he does give everyone an option. I can justify the fact that, yeah, that we don't have an option to tell him what we should do. He's created us. But I don't think that he looks upon humanity and says, they had no choice. They came into being without any options. Uh, and I'm not going to give an option. They didn't choose to be born. They didn't choose their parents. They didn't choose to be born under sin. They didn't, be, they didn't choose any of those things. They just are a result of my creation. I created everything. And humans procreate just like the animals. And so... What's your definition of faith? Uh, it, sub, substance it, if I understand it, I'll believe it, or is I don't understand it, but I believe it anyway. Well, both. If I uh, some things I understand and that gives me yeah. faith, some things I don't understand but, and I but, still have faith but your because definition has to be one thing. It can't be both. I think it encompasses both. Well, it's I, clear in Scripture that both are taught whosoever will so we as humans are aware of making our own decisions that's from the human perspective we find out after the fact that God has given a gift it's not earned now I choose who I give gifts to I don't give gifts to everybody whether that's right or not, that's God's prerogative. John, that passage in, that you 
go back to about he wants none to perish that's in Peter and it's a, it's addressed to the believer the beginning of that passage is that in context he's talking just to the believers there not to all the world and well they don't he, they're, it's impossible for under the your theory the, the believer to to be perish anyway because he's he's exactly. saved he's exactly. not exactly I mean, so there's the there's no option right he's the guarantor and, and, he wishes so he, the non, and his wishes are carried out but but you know I think that also I think that when Christ died on the cross his death was sufficient for all mankind and you've heard of that uh, analogy where there's a gate that says whosoever will as you approach the gate. And I think that's a, a, a true invitation, whosoever will. The will question is what's in mind. There's a difference between freedom of will and, for, and being a free agent. But I mean, that gets into a, a deeper thing, but when you get through that gate and turn around, look back, it says only the elect will to go through that gate. And that's by the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Because, I mean, you got to believe we're either totally dead in sin and cannot choose Christ, or we're only sick and we, we might choose Christ without God's... I mean, the whole question is limited atonement. We all agree we're not, we're not universalist in here. We, we believe that some die and go to hell, some, some go to heaven. So we're, we all believe in limited atonement. Christ on the cross it's a free invitation but it's limited by what? it's either limited by human choice or God's choice I don't think God gives up that prerogative for something so important I think he, he must be the one who chooses but I've said too much I think there's a, a matter of perspective uh, I had a pastor once who pointed me to Isaiah 10 where uh, it says, Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in the hands of my fury. God is saying, I'm going to use Assyria to punish my people. But later it talks about, but he, the king of Assyria, doesn't so intend. He doesn't look at his, say, I'm being used by God. He says in his heart, it's in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. And the point I'm trying to make, if I can, if my mind stays focused long enough, is, is that uh, I think everyone and those who are, who are going to eternal punishment will, will think that they are defying God. They, they say, I will not do that, or I cannot believe in a God who does this or allows that so and so in all of our lives we say this is the way I'm going to be this is what I'm doing but God is working I, I'm not doing this well let me uh, um, we, God God is, well, when we say, I'm, I sought the Lord in all the ways that you did, uh, God says, there's none that seeketh God. No one is pursuing God. And yet we put ourselves up against him and say, I was seeking him. But in his mercy, he caused you to seek him and finally find you in the right place. One of the things that that I've been thinking as we do the, the talk this morning is that we are, uh, I don't know if it's what it is, but we're always trying to get to the point where we're finished. I got all the answers now, I can relax and live the rest of my life. And. But think of the years that you spent, the years that you spent, ambiguous living because the Lord hadn't brought you to a certain place. And now you still have questions. 
and the Lord is still bringing you to himself, till, still leading you along. But uh, his mercy continues forever. And I think it, it continues past the time when we think we've got to get things in, in order in our own minds. You know, I'm going to add to your, build on to your comments. Charlie will remember while he was mentoring me, ministering to me, extort, uh, exhorting the Bible scriptures to me during 24 years. I have never said once to him, I'm seeking God. I always said to Charlie, I am seeking the truth. That's what I said to him. You remember that? I always said, I'm seeking truth. So God used that desire, seeking truth, to find him. But I never looked for God during that period. So you're correct. We don't look for God. God seeks us out. But he uses a different method to each different individuals. It's all, I think you and I are both going through gradual, tedious, long suffering, sanctifying process, growing process. And we are at the place where we are with our understanding. You have your level of understanding. I have my level of understanding as of right now. As time goes, Holy Spirit will may reveal a little bit more, a little bit more as we grow. And just like mother does not give a beef jerky to the newborn baby, she gives a milk. And then she wins the baby food. And then she starts to give a little bit of grown-up food as we grow. I think the Holy Spirit is doing that to us. Gil, yeah, weren't you, uh, when you said, you know, you were seeking the truth, um, if you define truth, the truth you were seeking was not the truth, because he said, I, I didn't am, know. I am the way, yeah. the truth, but you were seeking the truth, but it really wasn't the truth. I found out. Yeah. That took 40 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. It took 40 years to find out, what is the truth? Would you define that, what is the truth? He is the truth. Yeah. I mean, the truth, the pilot asked the question to Jesus, but he didn't wait to hear it. But from an unregenerate mind, you still had the concept of truth in there. Yeah. That you were looking for it. There, were, there was a kid at, or, uh, my four-year-old son had a birthday party this week, and one of his dads, uh, or one of, not one of his dads, one of his friend's dads came to me, and... I'd never met the guy, and we start talking, and within a few minutes, he's telling me his worldview of how we are, we were put here genetically engineered by aliens to uh, <laughs> mine gold so that the planet that they have that revolves around our elliptical solar system uh, yeah. will repair their atmosphere. Anyway, he, he went into this long thing. Oh, and at the end of that, he said, the truth is just the truth, man. <laughs> and I said, you are right about that. And he knew I was a Christian because when we uh, were celebrating my son's birthday, I prayed for my son. I prayed for all the people there. I said, we're Christians. This is what we do, that kind of thing. His wife is a Buddhist from Thailand. He, he talked about the attributes of uh, Buddhism and uh, Christianity, how they can synthesize all this stuff. Anyway, I didn't necessarily have to give him... God's truth is the only truth, but I began talking about truth and its ultimate <coughs> value. There's a guy named John Frame who wrote a book. Well, I won't even go into the book that he wrote, but he talks about the wills of God, talking about reconciling how, in one hand, you have a God who desires for us to have to come to him, you know? And at the same time, you have a God who ordains that an entire city of Jericho is going to get flattened, except for Rahab and her family. And 
how those things work in con in Congress, it does befuddle our minds. So I don't I don't have any idea. I mean, I think in God's desirous will, there is, you know, something a desire for that guy who believes that we're made to mine gold dust or whatever. That he would come to him, but I don't know if he's declared that or not. And that's the question: is, is has he declared it? Um, that's the only way that I can reconcile that in my my pre pre brain that tries to understand these problem of evilly kind of dilemmas. <laughs> but the separate wills of God, I think, is, is that Frame talked about really helped me begin to see that yeah, you have a God who both declares and a God who desires at the same time, and it's not crazy, the but it is feels like it. Antinomy, anti, tell me, um, most helpful, I can't remember the name of the book, it was probably 30, 40 years ago, but he said, in science and electricity, they talk about light as both particles and waves, and if you're talking about <coughs> one aspect, you talk about particles, and if you're looking at it from another pers perspective, you talk about waves. And in our minds, those are two different things, but both are true. Both are reality. Our minds aren't capable of holding both of those together because we have free brains. Yeah. But both are true and both work. And I think we're trying to reconcile something that the Christian community has been working at for 2,000 years. And if we're not coming up with the answer, why surprise? And we cannot <laughs> contain God into Motel 6, as Henry does. Yeah. The and complementarity also, of truth, you yeah. know, that Henry talks a lot about is, that's comforting, yeah. the complementarity of truth. I, I also yeah. think that Okay, there's, so on the one hand, this is a really good conversation to have among brothers and sisters. Um, and, and, you know, for us to explore um, in our own hearts and souls. On the other hand, in the same way that, um, it, you mentioned the word sacrifice, Will, when you were, I think, earlier when you were talking about the illustrated, um, um, whatever that was we were talking about. <laughs> um, I think that when we when we're struggling up against anything, whether it's you know ideas or, or you know trying to understand different theologies or, or or for me right now you know deciding to sell my condo and not knowing where I'm going to live, whatever that thing is that we're struggling against. And I don't know how to do this well at all. But if we will go to our knees or our face before the Lord and say, I don't know what to do with this. Just like Hezekiah did. That sacrificial, that, that positioning of ourselves below him. Open hands, open arms. What? There's something bigger God's willing to do with your struggle and all of our struggles. And I mean, I'm talking <coughs> to myself too. Let's let's struggle, but let's don't miss going to Him like this and saying, "What is it? You're there's something bigger here you're wanting to do with this. <coughs> what what is it?" And um, you know, it just that to me and those very few points in my life where I've, um, I think it was, was it Peter or John that said, you know, when Jesus said, are you, are you going to be for me or against me? Where else am I going to go? Here I am. So when I, when I hear the, the struggle um, and I also think about how Joe talks about um, that God asks us to die a, a thousand tiny deaths, you know, before we are ultimately with Jesus. I think um, um, 
think this is part of it, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying disengage your brain and don't don't try to wrestle with it. But but that's where the enemy wants you to stay. That's where he wants all of us to stay, is in that point of contention. And God wants to do so much more with it. The, the, um, the illustration that Virginia was trying to remember the book from, I think it was Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God by J.I. Packer. And he talks in there about the, like, the, the old question of are we free agents who are responsible for what we do? And he says yes. Or is God sovereign and completely in control of what we do? He says yes to both of them in the sense that light is a particle and a wave at the same time. And so I don't I, I think that's just an old question that I just have to accept the truth, the complementarity, they complement each other. Uh, they go together like in the heart, like two rooms, like Dr. Kropenheim says. There's two rooms in the heart. I can accept it with my heart. In my head, I just have to know that it's true, I guess. But, but in, in, um, it's the old thing of of the two lines going up. I mean, like that's that's what Joe said that he had. He almost dropped out of seminary because mm -hmm. of the question right. that you're asking, John. Because he he was he was like, how can people be responsible and God be in control at the same time? And and he, I remember he passed out to us that page of um, you know these two lines that look like here on Earth they look like they're they're parallel. In a, in a cloud somewhere, which is in, in God, somehow they meet together. And, and uh, I, we, we're not going to understand that. We may not ever, I don't know. But, but um, it's true. It's true that they do, because the Bible indicates that. A good illustration of that is if you've ever seen a, a railroad track and you're able to look down that railroad track for three or four miles, you'll see those lines come together. If, if somewhere out there, they do come together. They don't actually come together, but to your mind, they come together if you, if you look farther enough out. Gil has given me permission to bring up one point about his conversion that I think is, it kind of relates to this about how God can use all kinds of circumstances, even painful circumstances, to accomplish his purpose in our lives. And uh, some of you may not know, but Gil, he, Gil's got a bunch of brothers, and they're all doctors, but there was one of his younger brothers was named Wu Gil John. And uh, he was here in Chattanooga for a while and practiced OBGYN. And then he decided to go back to Korea and work in the family hospital in Korea. And uh, after he'd been back in Korea for a year or two, he had a routine chest x-ray that showed a spot on his lung. And it turned out to be a malignancy. And so he came back for Gil to evaluate him and uh, see, you know, get the best treatment he could possibly get. And he wound up uh, going up to uh, Harvard and uh, Peter Van Bruggen Hospital and being evaluated, having surgery, and then starting on some chemo and things like that. And um, Wugil was a Buddhist, but he was not as knowledgeable or as dedicated to Buddhism as Gil was. And so after he was recuperating, we all came down, we all went down to Charleston to uh, our condo. And so we had Woo Gill, Woo Gill's daughter, Woo Gill's wife, and then Gill and Kelke and some of their children. And uh, Gill wanted to have, like he and I had been having little Bible studies and things like that on a regular basis. He wanted to do that, but Woo Gill would have none of it. And so we would start the Bible study, Woo Gill would go to an upstairs bedroom, he would leave. And of course this was, this was really tough on Gil because he wanted very much for Wu Gil, who by this time we knew that he was not going to recover from this tumor. 
and he wanted him to have some kind of spiritual direction in his life, whether it was Buddhism or Christianity. He wanted something for him. But uh, Wugil would have none of it. He was a very sweet fella, very nice, easy to get along with, loved to eat little lobsters when we'd go out to eat. That was his favorite thing. But um, I think God used this in Gil's life. Because at that point, Gil was not a Christian, but he was a dedicated Buddhist, but Wu Gil would have nothing of a spiritual nature. He, he didn't want any of it. So I think, I don't, I'm not saying God caused his cancer, but I think God used that in Gil's life. Because it wasn't too long after that that Gil became a Christian. And the interesting thing is, at that time, I happened to possess a five separate all the tape, magnetic tape, you know, the recordings of some Korean preacher doing the Bible service. One tape was preparing for your death. The whole evening was dedicated to preach about preparing for your death. And uh, in, the, in his sermon, he talks about all the lives you have lived in the past. If you're not a believer, you realize suddenly, ah, I have been deceived, was the message. There is no hope, there is no future, there is no connection to eternities. So that message was ringing to my heart. So I gave that tape to him, and he listened to me over and over and over again. And that was a very interesting God's providence. And um, so after he went back to Korea, uh, I do not 100% uh, know where he was spiritually, but he was much more soft in listening to the gospel messages. Mm -hmm. Guys, if we could end, I know it's not, uh, um, something a little more encouraging and helpful. <laughs> if, if we are also listening to this because we want to have tools to share the gospel with others. I think um, that we need to always add to a discussion like this and, um, the love of Christ and where sin abounds, grace more abounds. Um, and if it doesn't come back to that, I'm without hope. But if, if we come back and, I, and that's the way we have to teach our little children even. We have to constantly, because self-condemnation, the world condemns us, um, our, our own conscience condemns us, but if we keep teaching one another through encouragement about the tremendous love of Jesus, the deep, deep love of Jesus, then we can end these ferocious discussions because that's, we do fight that way. I mean, it's a terrible battle on the inside. Um, but to end with the love of Christ um, in all of its fullness that just is underneath us, around us, over us. Since we are running out of time, I'm going to read the two, three sentences before we end. Go to page 262. Bottom paragraph, a nation which once was a Christian may continue for a time to partake the fruit of Christianity. These United States are a case in point. Our American liberties are in some measure products of the Christianity of founding fathers. Because we are fast forsaking their God, we are in process of losing the freedoms which they bequeathed to us, and yet in comparison with many other nations, we are still the land of the free. Go to next page, 264, bottom paragraph, in the dead middle. The Christian nations are rapidly reverting to the darkness of a paganism. A dense power of unbelief was settled down upon the very church of Christ. And then the bottom, five sentences. The son of the Western civilization, largely the product of Christianity, seems about to set. It's a heavy heart. So 
I think we covered up the 266. <coughs> How about next week going to <coughs> 288 since we have not touched too much the back part. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. And then starting from 267, go to, to 288 next week. And this book was written 50 something years ago. Yeah. yeah. It's on steroids now, what he's talking yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I have the next session book. If you have not picked up, please pick it up and pick this and then start to read and, and then chew on it. It'll be good for your soul. Let's go to the Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit for guiding our hearts, minds, thoughts, and our discussions to edify us. We send all this glory back to you. Lead us this day. Pray through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.